A very blessed Easter morning to everyone here, brothers and sisters in Christ, friends and family members of our loved ones here. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Easter Sunday celebrates the resurrection of Jesus Christ, three days after his death by crucifixion on a hill outside Jerusalem. We went through that phase. A couple days back on Good Friday, we gathered here, we remembered that historical fact that Christ bore the sins of the world and he died on a cross on Golgotha. My friends, as much as the death of Jesus Christ is true, so also the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a fact. It is truth and it brings us great hope because for all of us who are in Christ, one day we will receive resurrected bodies that cannot be touched by death and illness. But just in case we fall into that trap, thinking that Easter is just about one fantastic person coming back to life, we must root ourselves in the historic stories of, story of God's people. We must remember that the resurrection of Jesus is not a sudden event that came out of the blue. It was part of a larger story. And here I'm talking about God's story in our world, which is about God's plan to rescue, to redeem the whole of the created world from sin through the life, death, and resurrection of His Son, Jesus Christ. And that resurrection of Jesus Christ would be the first of many more to follow, and all those people would be us, people who are found in Jesus Christ. It is a story about good news for everyone who hears it because it tells us that right from the start, God created all of us and we all belong to Him. That's where we find our identity. That's in Christ is where we know who we are and where we are going. Now, this gospel story is so central to our identity as Christians that I think on this Easter Sunday, it is of first importance that we retell God's story again in our community. And here in our scripture passage, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 8, 1 to 11, right? But the center part is essentially a proclamation of the gospel story that Christ died for our sins, He was buried, He was raised on the third day, and that He appeared to His disciples. These four points make up the Good Friday, Easter Sunday story. And what better time to remember the foundations of our faith than today, the day that we remember the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So first, Christ died for our sins. The story of Good Friday. The gospel message begins by recognizing that we are all sinners in the eyes of God, the reality of sin. And that's the problem that we all begin with. In Genesis chapter 1 to 2, God gave his created people a vocation, but right? he gave humanity a responsibility. Humans, being bearers of God's image, we were supposed to live like an angled mirror, right, whereby God's glory, upon hitting the image bearers, is directed and spread forth into the world. And us, as image bearers, then gather the worship of all creation, angled through us, and we direct it back to God the Father. Right? This responsibility was abandoned when humanity first decided to disobey God, and thereby sin entered the world. And all human beings thereafter lived in that same pattern, a pattern of disobedience, a pattern whereby in our daily lives we have forgotten that great responsibility that God had given to His image bearers here in this world. God tells us the right way to worship Him and the, right, the correct way to reflect His love into the world but we have failed to do so. So sin in the Bible is not just a moment's lapse of judgment. 
It is not just that instant where we make a bad moral decision, but it is a life of rebellion against the Creator. Jesus Christ died for our sins, and that's where we begin. The Gospel story begins here. But in that same phrase, it tells us of the need of a Saviour, that there is a need for this person called Jesus Christ, right? And his death is part of the larger story. Sin is a serious matter, right? It separates us from the things that God is doing in this world. And Scripture tells us that the result of sinning against the God of life, the wages of sin, is death. It is a problem that runs so deep that human beings can never work our way out of it. Right? It is a pit that is so deep that we cannot crawl our way or climb our way out of it. And therefore, there is a need for a saviour. And in this story of God, we are told that there is an expectation of a saviour figure. Right? In, in our Christian language, we call it Messiah or Christ. And that's why we say Jesus is the Christ, the saviour, the saviour figure. Right? And Jesus Christ is that person who will rescue us from our sin by doing the job that humanity for ages and ages were given but were unable to do, which is to worship God rightly, right? to gather the worship of creation and direct it towards God the Father, and to reflect the glory of God through Himself as the as, as image bearer of God into all of creation. Christ was able to do it. And with that, upon bearing the responsibility of all humanity, he also bore the penalty, the penalty of sin on our behalf. Jesus Christ died for our sins. Now, the third thing that we can tell from this opening phrase, right, as, the, as one of the foundations of our gospel, is that Christ didn't die for a generic group of people. He died for you specifically, every single one of you. He died for our sins. It is a personal thing. He was a substitute. He took our place when we were the ones who were supposed to bear the penalty of sin. His life was given as a ransom for our lives. And that's where you come into the picture. Right? God's story is a story of salvation for the world. And when you came into the picture... Christ died for you. And in your acceptance of that, in your faith, in your belief of that, then you join that story that God is working in this world. Jesus died to save us from our sin, to give us a way to be part of God's story again. Jesus Christ died for our sins. Now the second part of this four-part gospel presentation is this, that he was buried. Critically important. This seems obvious for those of us who, who have been growing up with the Bible stories. Jesus Christ was buried. It is critical that we believe that Jesus Christ died and was buried as a dead man. As a dead man. He did not have a near-death experience. He was not put into a coma and then he was revived out of a coma. There was e there's even an ancient heresy that believed that Jesus, God, took on the human body of a person, right? A human being named Jesus at the point of baptism, and then lived in the God-man hybrid. And then on the cross, just before that man Jesus died, Jesus, the God, left the body. That, that, that's an ancient heresy. What we believe and what's written in Scripture is that Jesus died and was buried. He didn't abandon human body. He took on humanity. And that became a definition of who God is. A divine person who is willing to take humanity into himself and to bear not only the sins of humanity, but the penalty of that sin, which is death. He took it into himself. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, died and was buried. And this is the second point of a gospel presentation that we see, according to Paul. Third, he was raised 
on the third day. And this is the Easter truth that we affirm and we proclaim today. Jesus, who died for our sin, who was buried in the tomb, came back to life again. Without the resurrection, Jesus would just be another man with grand intentions, who died for a well-meaning cause, but was unable to solve the problem of death that comes with sin and our separation from God in his story. Without the resurrection, Jesus would not be the saviour that we need. We need a saviour who not only can pay for the price of sin for us and for the world, but can overcome the penalty of sin. We need a saviour who can look death in the face and tell death that your time is up. The death of death, in the death of Jesus Christ. And so today we affirm the truth that Jesus has indeed returned from the dead. Now, one of the most intriguing historical questions about the beginnings of the Christian faith is this. What was the reason that Christianity could grow so rapidly in the first couple hundreds of years? And why did the first disciples, the first believers, why were they so willing to risk their lives to stand on that testimony that Jesus Christ rose from the dead? On Good Friday, we heard about how there were many martyrs in the early church. And Jesus dying on the cross, of course, was different in quality but the many followers of Jesus were willing to follow his example and to bear suffering, even death, to stand on the fact that Jesus Christ not only died, but he came alive again. Why? The first reason, there are two reasons for this. The first reason was that these were people who saw the empty tomb. Right? These were people who discovered the tomb empty on Easter morning. And it was so fantastic for them that they had to, to, to tell people about it. The earliest followers really believed that Jesus was raised from the dead on the third day and they were willing to stake their lives on that truth. Now, the second reason for the explosive growth of early Christianity were the eyewitnesses' accounts that Jesus, not only, okay, not only the account of the empty tomb, but that Jesus appeared to them alive and in bodily form. And this leads us to the fourth point. A very important point which sometimes we, we kind of fail to understand, uh, we fail to appreciate the significance. And the fourth point is this, that Jesus appeared in his resurrected body to more than 500 eyewitnesses in the early church. Now, there were no less than 500. That's what our text today told us, right? He appeared to the 12, and then he appeared to the 500, and then he appeared to the 12 again. At that time, when Paul wrote this letter, 1 Corinthians, there were, the eyewitnesses were still alive. And so the story could easily be verified. And it was. The resurrection of Jesus was not just a doctrine that the disciples made up in order to to bolster their imagination of a new religion. Paul tells us, right, in this letter, that if Christ had not been raised from the dead, our faith is futile and that we would still be in our sins. Very valiant effort from Jesus Christ, but if Jesus Christ did not overcome death, then death continues to haunt humanity as the penalty for the sin that is in everyone's hearts. But the historical fact that we celebrate today is that Jesus physically rose from the dead and was seen by people. They talked to him face to face. They shared meals with him. They spent time with him in his resurrected body. The emphasis here really is on the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. It tells us that we are not just spirits housed in physical forms, but we are created by God fully in His image, our soul, our minds, our spirits, and our bodies. The created matter, the created order means a lot to God. 
and Jesus' resurrection is that pilot project, that, that first instance where we have evidence of God's grand story to destroy sin and to renew all of material creation. And that story is ongoing. Right? It is still progressing towards the fixed end point where on that day, all creation will come under the Lordship of Jesus Christ and everyone who is in Christ will receive resurrected bodies that are free from sin, from death and from sickness. So four reasons why we continue to celebrate Easter today. Because Jesus Christ died for our sins, He was buried, He was raised on the third day and He appeared to His disciples in bodily form. My friends, this is the foundation of what we believe. Right? There are many things that we can add to it. There are many deeper and more intricate doctrines that we can argue about. But this is the foundation of our faith. This is the reason why we continue to follow Jesus. This is the reason why we continue to live as Jesus lived because of the hope that one day this pilot project, now that it has started, will continue unhindered all the way until the end of days. Now, what makes these Easter truths especially relevant for us today is that little phrase found among these four points in today's passage. And it states that the death and resurrection of Jesus were according to the Scriptures. Do you see it in your Bible? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, right? Jesus... Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That's verse 3. Verse 4, He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. My friends, the life, death and resurrection of Jesus were according to Scriptures because the Old Testament Scriptures had been pointing to Jesus all along. And that's the story of God. And I want to convince you today that today you and I, we are living as part of that story. Right? We are people bearing that same story that is progressing towards the end point in history and that end point God has already told us about. But back to the start, right? God chose a nation, Israel. Right? And we read about that in the Old Testament. He chose a nation, a people, to reveal Himself to the rest of the world. Remember that, that God-given vocation in Genesis where God made us His image? He chose a nation to bear that same image and to reflect His love into the world. But at every turn of events, Israel failed to live up to that vocation. And remember, when we fail to live up to what God had, uh, had, had given, the responsibility that He had given to us, that's sin. But in the prophetic writings of God's people, the prophets held on to God's promises that He will bless the world through His people. Right? They believed in it. That was the story that they had been told. And even though the nation had failed and faltered, they believed that God's story would not fail. And so they, the, in their prophecies, they pointed to Jesus who would come as the suffering servant to do what humanity and Israel were not able to do. It was all part of the unfolding story that started from the beginning of time. And that means that the death of Jesus Christ was not God's backup plan, a point that we had mentioned during Good, Good Friday. The death of Jesus was not an accident. Jesus was not a young spiritual upstart that appeared out of nowhere to bring spiritual rejuvenation to a dying world. The death of Jesus was part of God's story to rescue the world from sin through the life, death, and bodily resurrection of His Son. That is the story from the start of Scripture. Jesus Christ, of course, is the climax to that grand story. He is, he is the point where the plan is shown to be fully on track and cannot be derailed again. Now, the thing about stories is this. What makes a good story good is, of course, I mean, it needs to have a good plot, right? It needs to 
have a good, good, good characters, good development, but it needs a good ending. It is so frustrating to read a book and to find a wonderful story at the start, and then at the end, it's a terrible ending. Right? Fans have, have gone up in arms because a movie ad adaptation of a favourite book would end in a different way. And in God's grand story, we are told not just about that climactic turning point where in Jesus Christ we see death destroyed and God's reign coming fully into this visible world, but we are told also of the ending of that story, that God will renew all of creation. But it is a cosmic event. It's not just good news for God's people, but a cosmic event. It is good news for the world. That God will renew the whole creation. And for us, at the end of the story, we will be in existence with resurrected bodies, just like Jesus. And so we know the turning point in the story where Jesus breaks the power of sin over this world. We also know the ending where all of creation, the whole cosmos, will be renewed. And the amazing thing about Easter for us is that when we give our lives to the resurrected Jesus and when we become followers of the resurrected Jesus, our names are then added to this unfolding story. Does that make sense? When we follow Jesus, our names are added to this grand story that continues to unfold, unwavering, unable to be derailed forever towards its intended ending. That's Easter for us. We are followers of the resurrected Jesus, right? That pilot project, that first glimpse of what the end would be like. And so when we commit our lives to Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, we are putting our names there. We're telling God, God, write our names into your story. We want to be part of it. At Vinje Lutheran Church in Wilma, Minnesota, there are wooden panels, if you can see on the screen, right up there, that little strip, there are wooden panels that, that circle the whole of the sanctuary. And from the start, you will see the names of the patriarchs, right? And there you have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and there are still a few more before that, right? All the way back to Adam. There are names of the witnesses of the faith circling around the sanctuary. And as you move on, you see the names of fantastic people that we read about in the Bible. Samuel, David, Nathan, Elijah, Elisha. I named my son that. <laughs> Hezekiah. Right? And you move on into the New Testament, the name of the apostles. And a little bit further, you, you, you find the names of kind of more modern-day saints. Right? And there you can catch a glimpse of Bonhoeffer. Right? Burgraff, the last name behind the pillar I cannot see. And then where these two priests are standing, they're behind the guy on the right. That's the start of the names. You see that? That's the start of the names. Now, between the end and the start, there are two panels that are left empty. And in this church, at every baptism and confirmation, the candidates who would come forward, who would profess their faith in Jesus Christ, who would say that, I believe in the resurrected Jesus and, and, and I want to follow Him and I'm going to put my names there in, as part of God's story. And that's, what a, that, that's the story that will be told to them. That, 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 that we do not just believe in an independent Jesus coming to bring about social change. No. We are putting our names into the unfolding of a grand story whereby we know that at that point of resurrection, death is defeated, sin is defeated, and that the ending is secure. That the whole of God's creation will be brought under the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. My friends, God invites each of our names to be inscribed into His story of salvation for the world. And that's the same for our friends who are seated in front in white. They are here today to be baptised into the life, death and resurrection, the story of God's work in this world. And for those who have been baptised as children, they are here to stand before us in a community who have witnessed them to growing up for what, six, 17 years, right? To, to say that, yes, 
I've been told this story, my parents have, have brought me up as part of this story, and I want to affirm, I want to confirm that faith. And for some of them, they have joined our community, and they say, this story is true. Many communities out there are living that same story, but we want to be part of this community. We, I, I want to show Jesus Christ's love to one another in this community, and they're going to be our members. Right? And so, my friends, God's story, when we find our names in there, we know who we belong to, don't we? We know who we are. We know our purpose. We know why we are put here on earth. We learn that we actually belong to God, and that's why we call ourselves Christians because we belong to Christ. Our lives have meaning and purpose only when we align ourselves to the story of God. Now, what this means for us is that we must then reject some of the misguided stories that perhaps may have formed you over the many years of life. For example, some of us, we, we, we live according to those stories that say that, you know, if we, we are only worth, we only have worth if we perform well, right? At school, if our grades are well, at work, if we do well at work, or at home, even at home, right? We are only worthy, we only have value if we perform well. That's the performance story, a story that's so common in Singapore. It misguides us by making us think that our purpose and value and worth is tied to our ability to do well in life. That's a misguided story. Another common story is the contamination story that convinces us that we are worthless if we have been emotionally or physically traumatized before, or if we had done something wrong and, and, and the, that, that contamination, that misguided story tells us, yeah, it's because you deserve it. Right? It's because you did something wrong. Now, if we are honest, Sometimes we believe in these stories about who we are. But these stories are not true. These stories are not true. When, when we commit ourselves to Jesus, when we know who created us, when we know who died to redeem us, Jesus Christ, we know who is the one who can define our story. Our lives are only defined by the one who writes the story of this world. So Good Friday and Easter Sunday are the chapters in God's story that tells us that we are not only created by God, but we are redeemed by God at a great price. And we are extremely precious to Him. And that through the death and resurrection of Jesus, God extends forgiveness for our sins. He washes them away. And He overcomes death with His bodily resurrection. And He restores the image of God in us he gives us purpose in our lives. He tells us how to worship Him correctly. And He gives us that responsibility to reflect His love through us now as redeemed and renewed image bearers to reflect His love into the world again. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's the good news of Easter. So brothers and sisters, friends, what are the stories that define your identity? Are they the misguided stories of this world? Or is it the grand story that God is writing for His creation? If you feel that your self-worth is being crushed under the weight of misguided stories, this Easter I want you to know that only one story matters. It is the story of God's great love for this world and for you that He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, into this world to die for your sins, that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. And on those scriptural, gospel, historical facts, we stand that Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He was raised on the third day as irrefutable proof that one day God will redeem his creation. That's the only story that matters. Now, during the season after Easter, over the course of four sermons, we want to build a rhythm for our lives so that we can live in a way that is consistent with this story. Now, many times when we, when we come to a, a, a moment of gospel presentation like this and, and we are clear, 
right, that God is doing something in this world. He has invited us to be part of that. And, and we, are, we are passionate. We want to join it. But when we head back into our regular life, the misguided rhythms cause us to lose sight of the only important story. And so what we're going to do as a community is we will build a rhythm of life that will keep us connected upwards in worship towards God. Remember, that's one of the vocation, right? That we will gather the, the worship of creation and as an angled mirror, we direct it upwards towards God. And, and, and we want to do that. We want to build a rhythm where we are connected upwards towards God. And then we want to build rhythms where we are in touch with Christ in us, the Spirit in us, inwards. We want to build rhythms where we are connected with community, with words, with one another as the body of Christ. And then, we want to build rhythms that direct us outwards. Remember that angled mirror again, where we receive the glory, the renewed image of God, and with that, we can reflect His love and blessing into the world. Up, in, with, and out. Those are the rhythms for a life that is firmly grounded in God's story. And so I invite you to take this Easter journey together with us as a community. Let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you because in your great power and according to your faithfulness to your covenant promise, you raised Jesus Christ, your Son, our Saviour, the Messiah, from the dead. And with that, you have given irrefutable proof to us that your promises are secure, that your story is headed towards the intended end, and that, death, that sin and death has been utterly defeated. And we thank you for this story, and today, as a community, we want to recommit ourselves to this story. Lord, by your grace and by your power, write our names into the unfolding story, that we may be part of what you are doing in this world, and that when the end of time and the end of days come, we may be seated together with you in glory. Thank you for your unshakable promises. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.